Right, I do. Okay, thanks very much, Mark, for having me, um, and thank you very much to all of you guys for attending. So just to make sure everybody is on the right, um, the right webinar, the session that we'll be going through this evening is Enhancing Relational Models with Graph, with graph Processing in SQL Server 2017. So um, as Mark said, my name is Terry McCann. I'm an advanced analytics consultant for a company called Adatis Consulting Limited um, in the UK. We are a Microsoft Gold partner for analytics and essentially all the consultancy work um, we do is around the analytics sort of arena. If you want to follow me on Twitter, please do. My um, Twitter handle there is at SQL Shark. I will tweet out a link as well. There's a couple of links in the presentation, but I'll tweet everything out at the end. So if you want to go there to grab anything afterwards, please feel free. Okay. So to kick things off, um, when about three years ago, I attended a conference session and I watched a session on graph databases. In particular, this was Neo4j. So this was about three years ago. And I sat there looking at this guy telling me about this graph processing. And it fun fundamentally changed the way that I sort of thought about how to model data. It was like a mind-blowing epiphany that potentially I'd been doing things possibly a little bit wrong for a while, and maybe there was a different model that I could be using. So from about that point, I started getting more and more interested in graph processing and various different types of graph database, um, and then was so incredibly excited when a couple of months ago, Microsoft announced that graph processing would be coming to SQL Server 2017. So this session is particularly about that. Okay, so to kick things off, if you do have any questions as we go, it is slightly difficult for you to shout them out, but please um, add them, add a comment, and then if something is really pressing, Mark will um, shout it out for you. So where to find the slides and demos? At the moment, I've got a the start of a, a blog sort of series going on for graph processing in SQL Server 2017. As more and more gets added um, to SQL 2017, I will add new posts here. I will also, just shortly after um, the demo today, once, once Mark has published a video, I'll stick the, a link to the video on the blog plus the slides and the demo, so you've got a one-stop shop for essentially everything that you might want. Okay, so in this session, we're going to try and do essentially three things. So in the first instance, we're going to look to try and understand what essentially is graph processing. Then we are going to do that by exploring the history, a bit about the theory of graph, the use cases and these three new parts of syntax that we've um, had emerge in SQL Server 2017. So we'll try to understand why graph is a big deal and how it could change the way that we work with highly connected data. Okay, so what is a graph database? Now, if you were sort of hoping that you were attending a session that we'd be talking about this sort of graph, Unfortunately, that is not what we will be talking about. Uh, we will be in no way talking about any form of data visualization with the one exception of this next slide, which technically is a data visualization, but is a data visualization of a graph process. So this is what we'll be talking about, um, a graph structure. So what we have here essentially is a typical um, social graph. So relationships between people. So who knows who? Simon knows Emma and Simon knows Sasha and Sasha knows um, Terry and so does Emma know Terry. And we can sort of see um, this social graph and these social graphs exist in many different places. And we'll come back to social graphs in a little bit. So to start things off, we are going to talk about the history of graph databases. And in particular, we're going to start with the Konigsberg bridge problem. So when I've delivered this session in person, this is a great one to see um, what the background is of the people who are in the audience. 
So when we did the session, and when I did the session last, I asked this question, who's familiar with the Konigsberg um, bridge problem? And of about about 80 people in the room, maybe five or six um, had heard of this problem. And funnily enough, those five or six people had all done either a computer science degree or a maths degree. And this is a typical sort of problem that pops its head up when you do one of those types of degrees. So if you are familiar with the Konigsberg bridge problem, um, just bear with me. If you're not, hopefully you'll find this interesting. So Konigsberg, a town here, which was in um, Prussia before, uh, before it became Russia, it's not actually known as Konigsberg anymore. Um, it has, it does have a new name. I can't remember what the new name is. But essentially, what Konigsberg was is it was um, is four land masses, so a north bank, a south bank, and two islands in the middle. And those um, four land masses are com are essentially connected by seven bridges. And the mayor of Konigsberg, <clears throat> as well as being a mayor, was super interested in maths and, math and mathematics. And he wanted to see if he could start at any one of these bridges and cross each bridge only once, and in doing so, cross every single bridge. So let's say you start down here in the bottom right one, and you cross over, and then you cross to the middle landmass, and you cross out. Can you cross through every single bridge? So that was his thing. Which route would allow you to cross all seven bridges without having to cross um, them more than once? So uh, not not particularly a minute, but I'd like you to take some time and have a look at the image and essentially try and work it out for yourself. Hopefully you can all hear the somewhat cheesy music playing through my uh, speakers in the background. Okay, who solved it? So you'll have quickly found that the Konigsberg Bridge problem is not solvable. There, there is no route that you can take that would allow you to cross those bridges once and only once crossing every single bridge. You will always get stuck. So there's eight attempts of mine with me ending up being stuck at every single time. And so the mayor of Konigsberg was really interested in this. He knew that he couldn't do it, but as a mathematician, he wanted to. He wanted the proof. He wanted to know, well, why can't I do it? You know, what's essentially preventing me from being able to do this? Like, what's the mathematical proof behind this? So he tried to work it out himself. Struggled. So he sent a letter to a Swiss mathematician called Leonard Euler. And so Leonard Euler um, was a mathematician in the 1700s when this problem was around. And um, so Euler, if you're not aware of him, if you've not done a maths degree or in somewhat a computer science degree, yeah, um, he is a very, very famous mathematician, um, came up with lots of mathematical notation, lots of things that you, um, you would use on a regular basis and just not realize that it came from this guy. So he wrote this letter to Euler saying, look, I've got this problem. And I just don't know how to prove why I can't do what I hope I could be able to do. And so Euler looked at the problem and he initially just dismissed it as being too simple. He thought, you know, this is just a child's play sort of thing, crossing bridges, it's nothing. But then he began to look into the problem a little bit more and started thinking, you know, hang, hang on, there's something here, there's something a bit more going on. And so Euler attempted to work this problem out in a more simplistic way. So looking at our image here, we essentially have got our north bank, our south bank, and two islands. So if we simplify that down into an image like this, what Euler looked to do was to take those four land masses and to essentially classify them as what he called a node. So each one of those land masses has become a node. And then connecting each one of those nodes or those islands, we had bridges. And what Euler did was um, to represent those bridges as what he deemed edges. So these two key terminologies are really important and will carry on throughout this presentation, node and edge. And alongside this, what he also worked out was the, um, the degree of connectivity between each one of these nodes and its edges. 
So if we look at the node on the furthest left, it has a number five inside it, which essentially represents the amount of edges that it has connected to it. So you'll see two at the top, one in the middle, and two at the bottom. And likewise, the rest of them, they have three. Essentially, they have three edges, or they have three bridges, essentially, connecting them. So how would we go about solving the, solving the Konigsberg bridge problem? Well, Euler sat there and he worked out a whole load of mathematical proofs and mathematical rules, essentially, where we have a, a graph of nodes and edges. What we need to have on each one of these degrees of connectivity in order to allow something like that. So the easiest way, essentially, is to remove a bridge. So now what we've ended up with is two odd um, two odd degrees of connectivity and two even degree connectivity. So our four and our two and our three and our three. And with that, that essentially enables you to be able to complete that problem. So if we go back to our original diagram and we crudely scribble out one of those bridges, we can now make that entire connection. Um, and funnily enough, or rather not funny, unfortunately enough, during the 1940s, um, one of these bridges was actually destroyed um, during the Second World War and actually completed the, um, <laughs> the Konigsberg Bridge problem. Um, yeah, so, so Euler came up with these, these various different rules, and the variety of these different rules essentially have become what we fundamentally know as graph theory. And so graph theory is the real backbone of what we're looking at when we're talking about graph processing in a graph database. So from what Euler came up with, from our graph theory, the key two things that we want to pick up with and keep are the nodes and the edges that connect them. So a node is an entity in a graph, and the edge is the relationship between those two nodes. So in the Konigsberg bridge problem, our nodes were land masses, and our edges were bridges. Okay, so moving on. So we know the theory. So what about what is a graph database? So in computing, a graph database essentially is a database that uses these graph structures, nodes and edges, for semantic queries with nodes, edges and properties to represent and store data. So we've established what a node is, we've established what an edge is, we haven't hit on properties yet, but we will come back to that. So a graph database by design allows for a simple, fast retrieval of complex hierarchical structures that are difficult to model in a relational system. And now this is the bit of the key, really. Difficult to model in a relational system. Not impossible. Definitely not impossible, but difficult. So with a graph database, we're aiming for something that's quite simple to do and that relieves some of the complexity and the difficulty of um, storing that data in a relational database system. Okay, now I just want to hammer home the point that what I'm not trying to say is you cannot do that in a relational database because I know the second I say that to an audience full of database developers, um, DBAs and BI developers, Whenever I mention anything, you're all going to do this. You're all going to be fixated on proving me wrong, saying, ah, no, I can do that in a relational database. I can do a recursive CTE. I can do this. I can do that. And, you know, I can get that answer. So we're not saying you can't do it in a relational database. What I'm more saying is it may not be the right choice. Okay. So... The problem with relational databases, why is it not the right choice? Okay, so why a relational database? Why do we call a relational database relational? What is it that makes it relational? When I asked this question um, at a conference recently, the resounding answer that I got was because, well, you know, databases, they deal with relationships. They are relationships between tables. That's why it's called relational, surely. But, you know, no, it's it's not. 
It's because a relational database system is fundamentally based on a handful of principles, one of which is relational theory. So the term relational doesn't come from the relationships between tables, it comes from the relational theory. So enforcing those sorts of relationships between tables is a product of what the database does, but it isn't, you know, it isn't the primary reason why it's called that. So let's take a simple example. I'm a website owner. Think of a website like IMDB, the Internet Movie Database, and I want to store movies and I want to store people. And those people could be actors in that movie and they could be directors in that, in that movie, but they could also be both. So as a developer, I would probably come up with something like this. You know, this is the intuitive approach that I might take. So I store my movies and I store my persons, my people. Um, and where I might have more than one person in a movie, I create essentially a many-to-many -many relationship where I store the person and I store the movie so that I can ensure I can have 10 actors in that single movie. And this type of relationship is what's known as a relation for relationship um, model. So we've created this relation, this actor and this director to handle this model. And, you know, this is a tried and tested pattern. Look at many different relational systems and they will have this exact same pattern. You know, it is, it's tried and tested and it works. However, it works for storage. When we actually want to come and try and analyze the data that we have in here, it's slightly harder. And when we want to extend this model, it's also hard. So if I come back, if the person who's asking for this comes back and essentially asks me, OK, well, I'd like to also see producers and I'd like to also see finances. So an actor could produce the film, they could also finance that film. And I'm having to extend and extend and extend this model and get essentially more and more complicated with these series of relation for relationships. And that also leads me on to this term impedance mismatch. If you're a developer, you'll probably be very familiar with this term impedance mismatch. If you're not, then we'll go through it a little bit. So as a developer, I might create a screen like this, or I might be asked to create a screen like this, where I'm asking somebody to enter essentially an invoice. And I'm not storing this as one single table. This will eventually be stored as multiple tables. So the customer information goes to a customer table, invoice to invoice, the product list essentially goes to its own table, our list of products are in another table, our messages. And I mean, how many of you have worked with databases where, you know, a database of a thousand tables is completely common? It's not something we haven't seen before. It's very common. And so we end up having to create tons and tons and tons of tables to essentially be able to handle a lot of what we're trying to, you know, trying to get to work in a relational database system. And it's not to say that that's bad, but maybe it could be handled slightly better. So a relational database system can essentially, for hierarchical data or very complex um, connected data, can essentially be quite complicated to model and store those relationships. And as you add more data, performance can degrade. Now, I know, you know, as DBAs, as developers, we can index, we can do performance tuning, we can scale up, we can scale out. But as we do increase more data, performance will degrade. And when we do have something like impedance mismatch, where we are working with hundreds and hundreds of tables, our queries can become very long and very complicated. And, you know, this just further hinders our development process. So back in the early 2000s, a couple of key papers started to emerge. So the MapReduce paper from Google um, came to us in around about 2004 and essentially um, if you if you haven't read this paper you have no doubt heard about MapReduce and how MapReduce works feel free to google it if not and um, and do have a look followed on shortly after that was another paper from Google about Google's big table 
um, and you'll look you'll notice between these two papers um, Jeffrey Dean and Sanjay their names um, appear twice in here you know these essentially are a almost a continuation and then another paper which came out in 2007 about Amazon's DynamoDB um, and these three papers really started to kick off this sort of NoSQL wave that we saw in the late 2000s, early 2000s, early 2010s that we, you know, we're still seeing. We're still seeing a rise of NoSQL databases, slightly less than we were, but they are still there. And the rise of NoSQL databases quickly moved on to popularize this term polyglot persistence. And so essentially, what polyglot persistence is, is where we are a large application process, an e-commerce platform um, in this particular example, where we have many different types of data we're trying to store. Yes, we could store those all in a relational database system, but that just might not be the best place to store that data. So if we take it from left to right, where we've got shopping cart and session data, as I say, yes, we could put that in a relational database system, but it's quite transient. You know, people add things, people delete things, people forget about it. So rather than having lots of incomplete orders, lots of sparse data in our database, we could store that in a key value store. Completed orders, that form that we were looking at before with all of the objects in there, that could just be stored as one nested document in the document DB. Where we've got inventory and price data, transactional data perfect you know that's our relational database system that's why it was made going on further to the right we have our customer social graph data now again that could go in a relational system but it could be much better suited in a database system that's essentially designed to support that data um, and if you want to read more about polyglot persistence, I thoroughly recommend that you have a research about Martin Fowler. He's got a couple of very good um, videos on YouTube. He also has a very good book on the subject called NoSQL Distilled. On YouTube, you'll find a very good video which is called NoSQL Distilled into an Hour, which essentially is that book attempted to be distilled into an hour, which is very good. So, we know as developers, relational databases are fantastic. They are our bread and butter. Um, but polyglot persistence tells us to use the right data store for the challenge that we're facing. And if we've got highly connected data, a relational database system just might not be the best store for that job. We might want to use something like a graph database. So, as I said, Relational database might not be the right answer, so what is the right answer? That could be a property graph. So now we're going back, remember our graph theory, our nodes and our edges, and now we're going to translate that theory into a graph. So, this is what we sort of had before, we had two nodes, we had a series of nodes, and we had edges that connected them. Now when we've gone into our graph database, our property graph, we've essentially added something very fundamental and key. You'll notice the line connecting them is not a straight line anymore, but an arrow. This arrow is a direction. So the connection between our two nodes, our edge, is directed. So to give that a bit more context, let's say our nodes were person and movie, and our edges were acted in. So we have something like Robin Williams acted in Jumanji. So it's that sort of relationship we have. We're going from one node to the other. We can't say that the movie Jumanji acted in Robin Williams. It, it, it doesn't work both ways. That edge does not work both ways. It is a directed edge. So let's take another example. A person directed a movie. So we could say that, you know, James Cameron directed the Titanic, and that works. Okay, so moving on. So going from a relational database to a property graph, there are a couple of things that we can do. So the first of those is that entities become nodes. So where we had an entity in our relational database system, that can become a node. So think 
person think movie think product you know these key nodes that you have in your relational system then think about how are they joined the primary key and foreign key relationships between those tables essentially will become um, some of the edges that we're looking at if we have many-to-many -many relationships those will also become our edges that sort of relationship becomes very easy to model and then where we've got attributed joins, they become edges of properties. So we'll dig in a bit more to what I mean by this term property. But just think if you had a many-to-many -many join, you had a many-to-many relation-for-relationship sort of table, you might have the, um, the movie ID and the person, then you may also store a few more attributes about that relationship, what they were doing at that point. So maybe how much money the actor made to appear in that movie. That could be stored against that particular table. So anywhere we have those attributes, those are essentially going to become attributes as part of our edge. They are going to become properties of an edge. So let's, let's have a look at an example. A user rates a movie. So a user, I'm going to take our user Ash, he rated the movie Alien, he gave it a score of a 9. So imagine IMDb, you scroll to the Alien page, I like that film a lot, I'm going to give it a 9. Um, and that, you know, that score is saved then essentially. That score is a property of the edge. Okay, so let's go back to this example that we had before. Now, Based on the rules that we had, we know that our entities, they're going to become our nodes. So our person becomes our person node. Our movie, we get a movie node. Okay, cool. We also know that our many-to-many -many relationships become edges. So the actor and the director. So um, person Ben Affleck, he was an actor in the movie Argo. He was also an actor in the movie Batman vs Superman. But... Ben Affleck was also the director of Argo. So you can see where we have this directional arrow again. So person Ben Affleck acted in the movie Argo, but the movie Argo was directed by Ben Affleck. So we have this directional loop. So that's one way that we could essentially translate that based on these rules into a property graph. So what are the type of things that we generally try to do with a graph database? So a couple of different sort of um, patterns that we're trying to solve. A very common one is what's the shortest path between two nodes? Now let's imagine the graph that we're looking at essentially is um, people and bus stops. And a person can get on any bus stop and what they want to do is they want to get from one bus stop to another and they can take a bus for one stop, hop off, change buses to go to another one, change buses again and go to another one. And they want to know from my local bus stop to the bus stop five miles away, what's the shortest path that I could take? So we could store all of those um, distances as edges and we can essentially write a query to say, OK, traverse those edges and tell me what's the shortest path I can take between those two nodes. And it says, OK, take this node, take this edge, take this edge, take this edge, take this edge and you're there. That's the shortest route. Another one is to find a node so many hops away from the current node. So essentially saying, um, I'm here, I want to find all the nodes that are 10 nodes away from me. So go out one, um, essentially one space, then go out another space and another space. So let's imagine we're talking about something like LinkedIn. And if you remember on LinkedIn, LinkedIn will say, um, suggest new contacts to you. And you'll keep scrolling, you'll keep scrolling. And that list is just never ending. There are just more and more and more people being suggested to you. So what's happening there is essentially the back end of that is a graph. You're parachuting into this huge graph right down to where you are. And then it's saying, OK, let's go out a level to all the people you know. And then let's have a look at all the people they know that you don't know. All your third level connections. And you keep scrolling, you keep scrolling and you go through every single one of them. And then it says, well, maybe you know, you don't know that third person, but maybe you know someone that they know. And you go that fourth layer out and the amount of people suggested to you, you know, just grows and grows and grows.
And then the third point is to find any node connected to another node. And this is what's known as polymorphism. So to say, um, I'm this person and I have this movie. Can you tell me that I was in this movie? Or can you tell me how the relationship is from me to that particular movie? Oh, well, I acted in a film with this person. You acted in a film with this person who was in a film with this person who was in the movie you're talking about. And traverse each one of those nodes out. Those are three very common patterns of what we look to do. And yes, you could probably do a lot of this in a relational database system, but it would be hard. It would be tough. Not impossible. Not impossible for the people who are going, uh, you know, I could probably do that. Not impossible, but it would be hard. OK, so what sort of use cases do we actually commonly see that graph databases solve? So the first one is the social graph. So what we've been looking at, who knows who, who are our queen bees, essentially. So in a social graph, you generally have somebody, uh, one, two, a couple of multiple people who essentially are what's known as the queen bees, the people who are the real influencers in that group, you know, who really spur it on. Back, um, you know, sort of like 10 years ago when um, mobile phones were a little bit less smart and you would sign up to one carrier, you would generally have your friends also sign up to the same carrier so you could get discounts on the service you were having. I can call my friends for free or, so, or something like that. And you generally find that there was somebody who was the real influencer who would influence what other networks people went to. And if that person left your network, it's not just the impact of that one person leaving. That person would realistically take a whole load of other people with them. And that's very dangerous for your business. So identifying who those queen bees are, who those influences are, um, allows you to quickly see, OK, you know, maybe we need to say, here you go, have this offer. We want you to retain a customer. Have this new upgraded phone for a huge reduction and make it a real you know, pleasure to be our customer. The next one is fraud detection. Now, there are many great ways of detecting fraud, many, many uh, different ways. And graph database is essentially one of those. And what a graph database is particularly good at is actually spotting rings of fraud. So where you have fraudulent activity happened by a group of people committing fraud. Now, that's a lot more common than just your average person. So it could be that a person commits fraud using a credit card, and that credit card may be registered to someone else who's also registered at an address, and that address is also registered to a different person who uses a different card. So you could traverse that relationship to say, okay, there's a chance that this other person, account holder three, could also be committing fraud, and we'll look into their transactions. The obvious use case is recommendation. Bob bought a product, so did Jim. Maybe Jim would also like those products that Bob bought. A very simple uh, recommendation engine. Um, another example, network and IT. Understanding the interconnectivity of your network. This is a real interesting one. So looking at your IT infrastructure, um, looking at the interdependencies of all of your servers, if something happens to one of your servers, what's the impact on the wider network? Sure, you may know, but modeling that in a graph database enables you to say, OK, if this one goes down, what's the impact to this VM server? Oh, this VM server would be down essentially also. OK, well, then that has a knock-on effect to these systems. It's just a knock-on effect to these systems. And you can sort of start to build up and see where you really need resiliency of your systems. It's a very interesting um, solution that's very easy to solve uh, in a graph database. OK, so we've talked an awful lot about the theory, the use cases, you know, the design patterns. So how does this relate to SQL Server? Um, so at the um, Microsoft conference recently where they announced SQL Server 2017, um, I think it was Joseph um, Siroff came up with this slide and showed it and essentially has one key point on here, you know, that, that I'm particularly interested in. The support of graph objects and graph querying to analyze complex relationships in SQL Server 2017. So what this is, is taking a graph database, taking 
the core essentially of a product like Neo4j, like Titan DB, like some of these other ones, um, Orient DB, and actually taking some of the power of that and putting it alongside your relational data. So you have the benefit of being able to use your relational database constructs, your indexes, um, column stores, etc., um, but actually column orientated storage. But alongside these relational constructs, these nodes and these edges. And they did that by essentially incorporating three new bits of syntax. The node syntax, the edge syntax, and the match syntax. Um, just after we explain these, what I'm going to do is dive into a quick demo and actually go through and sort of demonstrate how some of this works. Okay, so a node. So a node is essentially a variant of a table. So if you look at that top statement, I am creating a table called um, genre, and that genre has an ID, it has a genre, and I'm creating it as a node. So I'm saying create me this table as a node, which tells the engine not to build this as a standard table, but to store this as a node. And so a node represents that entity in our graph schema. So wherever we're thinking about an entity, a person, a product, um, a movie, that's essentially what's becoming these nodes. Now, when you create this table, that's not the only thing that gets created. It also creates a couple of columns that it uses itself. The main one being a dollar node underscore ID column, which gets created. And essentially what this um, dollar node ID is, it's a, a JSON um, string which uniquely identifies that particular node, that particular element within that node. So if it was a movie, that would be Jumanji. Um, if it was Alien, those two node IDs would be different. There's a brief line at the bottom here about recommendations on what you should do. You should add um, an index on here, as this should be always a unique, um, a, a, a unique string, essentially, a unique packet in that table. So that creates our nodes. Now, to create our edges, it's slightly different. So what I have here is, you'll notice, create table acted in as edge. But what I'm missing from this one is I'm missing the declarations. I'm not saying create me a genre ID. I'm not saying create me a genre. I'm just saying create me a table as an edge. So what this is going to do is just create me a basic edge table, which, get, which will want to receive the from node and the to node. So where am I going from and where am I going to? So how am I connecting two nodes together? And what you want to insert into that table is the node ID from one table and the node ID to another table. We'll have a look at that. And then the last piece that fits this all together is the match syntax. So you'll see here, uh, you'll look at this statement and think, oh my god, this is a awful looking statement. Because with graph processing, we don't have um, the sort of ANSI 91 standards um, joining tables. We're not saying I want to do an inner join to this table on this equal to this, inner join this on this. We are back to our sort of ANSI 89 standards, the Oracle, original Oracle way of writing a series of tables. So I want to select this table, comma, this table, comma, this table, comma, this table. But remember, these aren't tables. These are nodes and they're edges. They're types of tables, but they're different. So we don't need to know what joins each one of them together because that's what our edge is doing. Our edge knows the relationships between these. We don't have to express it. We don't have these foreign keys. We don't have these primary keys. It's all baked into the edges. So you'll also see the match syntax looks a little bit funky. So it's known as um, an ASCII art based syntax. It's heavily based on Cypher, which is the Cypher query language from Neo4j. Cypher um, has attempted to also be open Cypher, so an open standard language like SQL is for relational databases sort of across um, graph databases. So looking at it, what we essentially have is a node-edge-node node relationship. And you'll see the brackets around the edge indicate the direction that the relationship is going. So that's why this direction is really important. So we're going from node user1 through our reviewed relationship to a movie. 
then we are going from the other side, our user 2 through review 2 to a movie. So what I'm saying is, find me the users who rated the same movie. So give me the users who rated the same movie. And this sort of like syntax becomes a little bit tricky to get your head around, but we've got a demo coming up. So we'll show it in a bit more detail and try and describe it that bit better. Okay, the demo. Let's get on to that and we'll try and indicate a bit better of what's actually going on. Right, so I'm hopping over to SQL Server. Um, I've got, this is actually running SQL Server 2017 CTP2. Obviously RC1 and RC2 are both out now. There hasn't been a great change to the degree of functionality that you have in graph processing at the moment. So CTP2, RC1, RC2, I do believe this is in Azure um, DB now as well, so you can probably do the same thing um, in Azure. So if you download um, this source file, there's a couple of um, queries here. So first one to create the database, then we're gonna create our nodes and edges. We're gonna populate those nodes and edges. We're gonna do some queries. Um, and then there are two optional ones that we won't go into here. Um, which relate to users and ratings and actually creating a bit of a basic recommendation engine to say, you know, you like this movie, maybe you'll like this movie. Very crude, but just a sort of example of how that might work. So I'm not going to create the database because um, it needs to be populated with some raw data. So what I'm going to do is skip that process, but let's have a look at this raw movies um, table. So this is the raw data that I'm working with. This is some data shredded from um, IMDB. It essentially, each line relates to a movie, and that movie has who was the first actor, who was the second actor, who was the third actor, who directed it, et cetera, et cetera. Cool. So let's have a look at some of this syntax. Right. Our first one, we are going to create a genre table. We'll follow that up by a movie table, an actor, and a director table. Now, I could have modeled these as a single person if I chose to. I could have just had a person, and that person could have been an actor or a director. There are multiple ways that we could have modeled this. So I'm going to build out those nodes. Okay, that completed. And I'm going to build out a couple of basic edges. So a person who acted in a movie and a person who directed by a movie. So essentially a movie is directed by. So in this example, we're going from our, our actor to our movie uh, that way. And then in this example, we are going um, a movie is essentially directed by a person, in this case, a director. And let's populate these ones as well. I just realized I'm making the mistake of loading those into the master database. So let's actually build those out in the movies database. Um, so what you'll notice is if you're using SQL Server 2017, is these tables that I'm building will not appear down here with our standard tables. We essentially have this new folder up here for graph tables. Now, if I expand that node, we can see all of these new tables. So our actor, our actor there is indicated with this tiny little blue box down here, which essentially shows that, you know, that is a node. And then this one down here, this reviewed one, it shows a circle dash circle. So that's indicating that there is an edge. So node is the blue one, the white ones down there with the two essentially are an edge. Okay. And let's populate this one. Let's populate some of these tables. So what I'm doing is I'm just using a bit of syntax to a um, bit of queries, creating some views essentially to populate these tables. So I'm going to insert the movies into our movie node. And that's inserted 5,000 movies. And now when I execute that query, this is what we essentially have. So we have the data that I've just inserted plus we've got this additional column over here which is our dollar node id now you see it's added this sort of like GUID over here um, if you want to query this you can just query it as that table dollar node id and that GUID um, doesn't particularly matter when you query you don't need to worry about what that is called 
And what this has done is it's stored what's the type. You can see this is JSON, this is key value pair, key is the type, um, value is the node, and there's a pair of them, key value pair. Schema is DBO, the table is movie, the ID is zero. The ID is zero, not movie one, because essentially that is what I've taken from my old relational way, and this has actually stored this as a zero-based ID. I will do the same for um, the genre table inserting some stuff into there. I'll do the same for directors and I'll do the same for actors. Okay. Right. Now we're going to populate our edges. So this is where it gets a little bit trickier to handle because what we need to populate in an edge essentially is the node from the node ID from the table we're going from and the node ID of the node that we're going to. So if you look at this query here, what I'm doing is I'm joining a whole load of stuff together and then I'm joining it also to the nodes so that I can pull out the node ID of an actor and the node ID of a movie to give me who acted in that movie. So I'm going to populate that one with who acted in it. And there we go. We've got um, 15,000 um, people going into there. And now if we have a look at that, this is what's actually being populated when I've inserted into that table. So we've got the edge ID. So this has been um, generated when I've inserted. This tells, this uniquely identifies this edge. And it's copied over the node ID. So this is the node ID from the actor node and the node ID from the movie node. So this is our relationship. There's no primary key, foreign key constraint. This is how the match knows that there's a relationship. All right, let's just populate this table as well. And let's go and dig into some queries. Okay. When I originally started looking at this, I looked to see, right, who's the first actor I can use? And the first actor I found was um, 50 Cent. And I'm not a huge 50 Cent fan, don't get me wrong, don't think I'm this crazed 50 Cent fan. I use him in all my examples, I don't. He was the first person who appeared. So, right, I want to find all of the movies that star 50 Cent. So I'm going to do that in a just standard relational way. I'm going to select from that table, based on those three columns, find me all the movies that contain, that are by, that essentially acted in with 50 cent. And there we go, we've got those five. So now how would I do that in a graph way? Let's just execute this one. Yeah, that's good, that's working. So what I'm saying is select me the movie from the actor, acted in, and movie. So we're going from a node, relationship node, and I'm doing this with my match syntax. I'm saying, um, take me the actor through the acted in to the movies, and then I'm filtering this one down to give to push me through this relationship. So I'm saying, give me the actor 50 cent, and then give me all the movies he acted in. And sure enough, those are the same. It's the exact same answer. Now, I bet you're thinking, looking at this, well, I mean, these two queries are not that different. I mean, I'm getting no real benefit out of storing this data in this way. Okay, so let's get a little bit trickier. Now I want to know, give me all the films who, give me all the films that actors were in who also starred in, sorry, give me all the actors who also starred in one of these films. So starting off with 50 cent, we're going out a node, and then we're going out a node further. So we're sort of a third of the way out. We're um, three ways out. Okay. And so that will give me everybody who acted in those movies who, who isn't 50 cent. I don't want to see him again. And I've done that using a CTE, and then I've done that by using a couple of union statements. Again, you could do this better probably. We could do it in a different way. And that works. That gives me all those actors. Again, it's pretty quick. I returned pretty quickly. But I now go from this huge amount of syntax to this relatively small amount of syntax, and I get the exact same answer. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying from actor one, um, I also want to return who's the actor two. So I'm going that sort of like node, node, node relationship. Um, I am looking at who was in a movie, who acted in the movie, and the movie itself. So I'm saying actor one, give me all the movies that they acted in, 
then give me all of the actors who starred in that movie and essentially filtering that down to 50 cents so I'm going that bit further then if I wanted to go that level even further I could say okay well based on these people now I want to know all the movies that they were in so we're going that extra layer out we're now going sort of like a fourth layer out okay and you'll notice I've that works so essentially our matching is we're going actor to actor then to movie and then we're saying give me that movie give me everybody who starred in that and then give me everybody who acted in any one of those movies and then return me the movies so you're going all this way through just getting further and further and further now I've not written the T sequel for this query because it would be monstrous. It would be a nasty looking query, lots of different nested um, queries essentially to get us there to do it. And then I could go further and further and further. But to do that in a relational way, it's gonna slow down and slow down and slow down because I'm having to do all this nesting and nesting and further nesting. As I say, there are two more examples here that um, if you download the scripts, you can dig into. But for the moment, we'll stop at that example and we'll go back to our slides. OK, so what I was talking about, the depth. So we're going from one node through an edge to another node and then through that node's edges to additional nodes and then to additional nodes. Um, in the early days of Neo4j, this um, sort of table was created. So where we have a depth of two, when comparing a relational database and Neo4j, so a graph database, they were pretty equal. So going to, it didn't really matter. That, that sort of relationship was very easy. Then we went to three depths. So based on the amount of records returned, obviously this is a lot more than the records I was returning, so the time differences would be different. But going to that third one, our relational database took 30 seconds, whereas our graph database still only took a frag, took hardly anything, you know, less than a second. When we push that up to four degrees, so we've got 600,000 records being returned, our relational database is taking 1,500 seconds, whereas our graph database is just taking under just a little bit over one second. Then when we go to that fifth layer out, so we're going through all those things, you imagine how big this graph is getting out, going from, say, one to three, and then three nodes to, say, 100 nodes, those 100 nodes to 1,000 nodes, 1,000 nodes to 100,000 nodes. The time to run that in a relational database, they gave up on testing. It took so long. Neo4j, graph database, just over two seconds. Why? Because it's designed to handle that sort of query pattern. This is what it's made for. This is what it's made to handle. Okay, so just to finish us up, we'll talk a little bit about um, the caveats in Match and some of the limitations of what's in the graph processing engine currently. So with a match, um, you can repeat the name of nodes, but you cannot repeat the names of edges. Where you get really complicated queries, I recommend just repeating the names of nodes as well. So you say node 1 as n1, node 1 as n2, node 1 as node 3 example. Um, edges cannot be repeated, edges need to be aliased. If you're going to use an edge multiple times, it needs to be aliased every time. There are a few more match caveats there that you can read through in your own leisure. So limitations. This limitation screen will look a little bit similar to some of the U cases that we might want to do. Okay, limitations. So if I want to work out the shortest path at the moment using SQL Server 2017, it's not really possible. <laughs> You can kind of do it. You can kind of do it by a little bit of pre-calculation um, and recursive CTEs. But, you know, we're not, we're not doing the right thing yet. So it's not really there. So this transitive closure, find a node so many hops away from me. So any node, again, that almost doesn't really exist at the moment again you can sort of do it with a CTE and there's a couple of good blogs that I've got um, referenced at the end that will enable you to do it and the third one which is polymorphism to say I'm starting at this node find me the route to get to another node that also doesn't quite exist at the moment so there are loads of more limitations um, which again I'll, I'll let you read in your own leisure so 
Um, let's just black out my screen for a moment. So graph database processing in 2017 is very 0 0.1. <laughs> you know, I can imagine it's going to get there. It's going to get better. But at the moment, it's very 0 0.1. We can do the basic things that I sort of showed, and we can do very basic rudimental sort of recommendation engines. So what I would say, um, let's just pop my screen back up is if you are attending the PASS Summit, I will be doing a more in-depth version of this session for PASS Summit. It's a 75-minute session as opposed to a 60-minute session, so you get a couple more demos, a bit more of an in-depth um, look at what I was um, hoping to show if we had time. Um, there's a bit about the stuff there if you go to the PASS Summit website. Okay, so just to finish, what I would say is graph processing is amazing. However, SQL Server is just not quite there yet. But when graph processing in SQL Server can rival a tool like Neo4j, you know, we've got an incredibly powerful system. Not having to export our data into another platform to be able to do that type of analysis, being able to push that analysis to our data, you know, that's going to be pretty powerful. So, last little link there to the original blog which I'll stick the slides up in is there a whole load of my connection details are there so if you want to get hold of me it's at SQL shark if you want to email me please feel free tpm at datas.co.uk that's the email address to our um, apologies my telephone ringing that's our web address and also our Twitter account so thank you very much for um, taking the time to listen to me. I thoroughly enjoy talking about graph databases. Um, there are a whole load of research links at the end here, which uh, pretty much is everything available at the moment on graph databases. So download the slides and please do have a look. So thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me. Um, if you do have any questions, please fire away. Um, if not, please do tweet me as well. Excellent. Thank you very much, Terry. Um, we have one question from, I believe it's Craig, who, okay. uh, this is this was quite early on that Craig asked this question, um, mm -hmm. talking about when you, well, if you have an existing table, can you uh, specify as node in the an alter table statement? So can you convert an existing table into a node? No, you can't. Um, and you probably don't want to. Um, yeah, no, it, it does need to be a, a new structure. Um, you will need to create a, a, a brand new table. And depending on, yeah, depending on what you want to do, you probably don't want to do that initially. You might, you may want to, especially now, um, because it's still so like sort of version 0 0.1, you probably don't want to lose the structure that you have, but there will be certain use cases where, you know, maybe changing that table to a graph table by doing a sort of a brand new table and then moving your data over will be beneficial. But probably at this stage, there are basic examples, but you may want to wait until it gets a little bit more mature. Okay. That kind of leads me on to another question. I don't even know if it makes sense to do this, but is it possible to query, um, have a combined query, so you're querying graph data as well as relational table data in some kind of join? Yeah, you definitely can, completely. You can you can definitely do that. You can, you see this is, yeah, that's part of the real power of pushing this engine alongside um, your relational engine is you do the grunt of the work in your graph database and you work out what you essentially need to be looking at. And then you can just extend that by joining to your normal relational tables. Yeah, there's um, actually a very good example um, that Microsoft Research did called the Million Song Database, where they produce a recommendation engine. Um, and there is a link somewhere in this big list of links, um, somewhere in the middle. Oh, yeah, they I actually see, yeah. show they show doing that. So they show actually combining your graph tables back with your standard relational database tables. 
cool. You said yeah. early on about creating, I believe it was a primary key against some of your tables to prevent duplication. Um, so that, that leads on to another question. I don't think you really talked about indexing graph tables other than that. Is, is there any need to do it or, or not? So they yeah, they said so they. I mean, they at the moment they recommend. So Microsoft recommends that you put um, uh, you put indexes essentially on your node IDs, um, and also you'd be best to put an index on your edges as well. That isn't really a great deal that's actually been published about the best way to do performance tuning and to be honest I haven't really dug into it enough to say categorically you know what sort of impact it has um, I'd be really intrigued to actually do a couple of use cases to see when you're inserting a large amount of data into there you know what sort of impact um, an index would have on your inserts as you know well as your read performance so no really good question cool um, that leads me also on to query plans. So uh, I'm presuming that the standard query optimizer isn't processing the, or isn't um, creating plans for the graph qu queries, or is it? You know, I don't actually know. It's a very good question. It's one that I should definitely look into. Um, you do get a query plan back. Okay. Um, yeah, you, you can see the query plans for them. Um, but to what extent what's actually going into into which element i'm not too sure but that is a that's a, a great avenue to research that yeah. i will definitely have a look and um publish some put some stuff up on the blog about it what do the operators look like in the query plans for the graph stuff um, let's have let's um, run one Let's stretch this one out. So, you know, so we're looking at a lot of the normal stuff that we have. We're looking at, you know, we've got table scans, that sort of thing happening over here. We do have a clustered index scan happening up there. So, to what extent this is a representation of the best sort of representation that SQL can give you at this point. Mm -hmm. I'd imagine based on the sort of lacking of functionality that there is currently, that there's also probably a lacking of functionality from this point of view. Yeah. So to what extent this is actually giving you a complete clear representation, I'm not too sure. Okay, cool. I mean, looking at that plan, it almost seems um, as though the existing data storage formats are being used to store the mm. graph tables. Is, is that what you understand to be the case? So that, um, um, you know, a data page for graph is exactly the same as a data page for a normal table? I would imagine they are, yes. It, do you, are you aware of any compatibility within memory OLTP here? I don't believe there's any compatibility at the moment with um, in-memory. So some of the limitations, um, let's stick that slide back up. So there are quite a few things. So node and edge tables cannot be memory optimized currently. Uh, okay. But that is that is currently. Uh, but I can see, you know, there's a massive, the immediate benefits of thinking, okay, so I've got this better structure that maybe I could put in memory as well. You know, that's, you, know you start thinking, oh, I can do some cool stuff with this. Um, yeah, so hopefully, as that sort of grows, yeah, the, the big one I think there as well at the bottom is you have one graph per database, and you can't do any sort of cross-referencing uh, or anything like that. If you've got multiple databases, you could have multiple graphs that are very constrained to the single um, database that you're in. Okay, cool. And I think, um, just bear with me one second. Oh, um, so in relational query writing, I mean, we're, we're often told by some of the experts that you can write queries in a different way to get the results in a more efficient manner. Uh, I, I just wonder whether when you're writing a, a, a graph query, it looks to me like it's almost like an instruction to get the data back. So the question is, is can you write graph queries in different forms and more efficiently? Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's a very good question. Um, so, 
Yeah, I mean, so what you have, so it's still a declarative language. So essentially, you know, what you're writing is going to go away to the engine. The engine is going to decide the best way to write it. But essentially, so, you know, there is different things about using multiple nodes, using single nodes um, to produce the better queries. The match syntax is a little bit lacking at the moment in sort of like the power of sort of things that you can do with Cypher. So Cypher, you can, rather than having to add additional elements into your where to filter down results you can do more interesting things and the real power and the real sort of like complexity comes in how you write that sort of cipher query in near for j so because match is a little bit basic at the moment hopefully as they improve that and as it becomes slightly more akin to a cipher query we will start seeing um, you know better ways that you can tweak a query to get the best sort of performance um, but at the moment I would imagine you, there's essentially only one route that you could sort of draw out depending on the model that you have to get to the answer that you want if you change the way that your data is modeled you can change the way that your match works but based on that you're only ever going to get to that right answer by constructing that match query in a particular way okay cool um, and the final question um, so you, I, you mentioned one of the use cases of graph being uh, fraud detection. So I'm presuming yeah. from that you're, you're suggesting that graph DBs fit very well into predictive analytics. Would that be a correct assumption? <laughs> Ah, yes, yeah, definitely, yeah, definitely, they, you know, they work very well together. So you think now, with the stuff that we've got in 2017, with R services, with Python services, with the graph database as well, so by having some of our data in a graph structure, that we can then do some predictive um, machine learning or some predictive sort of statistics in R, based on the data that we have in those tables, and you can do that. So Microsoft have done some interesting stuff um, already with that, but combining those two technologies inside the engine alongside all your data, you know, you can start producing this incredible, you know, be that recommendation engine or be that fraud detection or something like that, all alongside your data without having to go to any of these other platforms or applications or servers. It is just incredibly powerful you know it's a really exciting time I think to be picking up with graph databases and it's been just sorely missing from from a Microsoft database offering so Microsoft have had graph systems for a while they had um, Trinity DB which powers Microsoft Bing um, and obviously you may you may have seen that graph processing's also been pushed into Cosmos DB now yeah. and that's quite quite different to the graph processing that we see here but you know there's this this knowledge in Microsoft that graph is important and they're pushing it out now I mean you, you one of my criticisms of SQL Server in recent years is that I've, I've often felt that it's almost turning into bloatware that there's too many things being crammed into it but you've almost changed my mind um, thinking that actually that could be a good thing uh, now that graph is here yeah, so, so you take the example of Python, and you're like, great, I can run Python inside SQL Server. And it's definitely the most expensive way that you could ever run Python. Um, but I think, you know, as these things do grow, and as, as this, especially with Graph in there, and um, we can start doing that, yeah, I definitely feel that it's, 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 a good, it's a good way that Microsoft are moving. Brilliant. Okay, well, uh, that, that wraps up the questions, and uh, I, I really want to thank you for a brilliant session. It was really interesting. I've learned something today, and hopefully I can talk you into coming back sometime. Oh, of course you can, definitely. I'd love to. Great stuff. All right. Thanks, everybody.